it's been a while since I sang this song. Um, actually, I think I learned it when I was around 10 years old, listening to Mom's Hi-Fi. Now, that's a predecessor to stereo, for those who don't remember. The song is called, My Lord, What a Morning. Yeah. My Lord, what a morning. My Lord, what a morning. Oh, my Lord, what a morning. When the stars begin to fall, when the stars begin to fall, no more grief and pain for me. I heard from heaven today. God's going to give me his right hand. I heard from heaven today. Oh, my Lord, what a morning. My Lord, what a morning. Oh, my Lord, what a morning. When the stars begin to fall, when the stars begin to fall, on my way to the promised land, I heard from heaven today. Yes, my Lord's going to set me free. I heard from heaven today. My Lord, what a morning. My Lord. stars begin to fall, when the stars begin to fall. Happy Sabbath to everyone. I will be reading from Philippians 4, 10 through 13. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concerns for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to con content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any, in any every situation, whether, uh, um, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Amen. Thank you, uh, Rocio. Uh, and, and Bill, I was blessed. Um, the song this morning took me back to when I was a teenager and uh, listening to a particular music group that I think influenced me, laid, laid groundwork, opened my heart really to accepting Christ in my life. And that was one of the songs on that album, uh, My Lord, What a Morning. So uh, a real blessing. 
And it's a blessing to be here. You know, I was thinking um, this week as I was preparing to come over here, I think this is like the fourth time in Prineville in the space of a year. And I thought, maybe I'll just transfer my membership. <laughs> but it's a little far, so probably not. But anyway, it's always good to be with you uh, here. You know, this time of year, I, I get a little bit sentimental and, and a little bit historical because, you know, we are blessed in this country. Uh, I was thinking, what other country, and I was, I was mentioning this with another con uh, congregation, what other country is there that has a national holiday that celebrates Thanksgiving to God? Uh, I was reminded there is one besides the United States of America, and that's, a, that's Canada, Canada. My wife is a Canadian, and I should have known that. But anyway, uh, any other Canadians here? Nope? Okay, she stands alone. Anyway, um, we have this heritage, uh, really wonderful heritage, of worshiping freely in this country, and, and still having some focus on God, although we see uh, a strong trend toward secularism uh, in our country, and, and that is very sad, and even atheism in our country. How many of you, and I'm just kind of giving you a little preamble here before I launch into what I'm really going to get into today, but how many of you are familiar with uh, the history of, of Rhode Island and the individual who uh, was responsible in many ways um, for what we have to th today by the name of Roger Williams. My wife and I spent uh, the better part of a week in Providence, Rhode Island last January, and I was just reminded again, uh, here was a man who went around 1636, a fair bit ago, decides that he's going to stand up against the prevailing current of church control of the time and set out to create his own community, which is one that fosters religious liberty, freedom to worship as you feel you need to do. You know, uh, there's an old saying that it's easy to take the people out of Egypt, but it's harder to take Egypt out of the people. And it was a little bit that way with what happens with our pilgrim fa uh, fathers as they came to this country trying to get away from forms of enforced worship and having to use the Book of Common Prayer in their services. They wanted to worship freely, so they came over here. But what did they do when they got here? <laughs> they began to enforce certain kinds of religious practice. If you didn't do it exactly uh, the way that it was done in some congregational congregations, uh, you were persecuted, and Roger Williams stepped away from that and was willing to be brave enough to pave the way for uh, that wall of separation between church and state that we still enjoy. But we do not know how long that will last, do we? We do not know. And prophetically, we know that it may not, it may not uh, continue too much longer. I wanted to ask you to do a couple things for me as we begin. Number one, to remember the time or times when you were the most thankful, okay? Just take a moment and think about the times when you were the most thankful. I'm going to share a couple while you're thinking about that of times when I was the most thankful. The first one was when I realized at the age of about 14 that Jesus forgave me personally of my sins. And I understood him truly as my Savior. When, I, when that came through to me, I was so excited, I, I did somersaults. Now, I wouldn't express it that way now because I'd break in pieces and not get up. But that's how I expressed it. I was very grateful, very excited about that. The second time that I think that I was probably the most thankful and I've related this story here, so I won't re relate it again. But it was a time uh, during the holidays on the road when we escaped, uh, miraculously, in my view, angels were there, a, a uh, direct head-on 
uh, accident that could have killed all of us. And coming away from that, uh, I, you know, I was ex exceedingly uh, thankful. But that thankfulness did something. It changed my behaviors. You know, thanksgiving isn't just, or thanks isn't just an emotion, is it? Thanks and thanksgiving should be a lifestyle. Not just an event, but a life philosophy, a lifestyle. So, as you've thought about those, those moments or those times when you were most thankful, why? Why were you most thankful? Well, I suspect it will be similar to what I experienced in the, in the two things that I have just related. And that is that I knew that what I was, had experienced on the end of those events was far better than what I deserved. Hmm? Could have been far worse in any given situation, and yet things came out better than what I deserved. And that's really the way salvation works, isn't it? We get a whole lot better than what we deserve. I'll never forget, <clears throat> and if I related this story here, please forgive me, I forget sometimes. Um, it was at the end of uh, a VBS, Vacation Bible School. And uh, there was a celebration there at, at the end. We had a special service. And I remember the kids, you know, all participating. But at the end of it, there were parents from the community. And I remember one parent, as we were standing around and talking in the sanctuary, this particular parent, I am sure, had not much of a, a, a spiritual background. I don't think he'd been in a church much. But as he was there to, to pick up his daughter and uh, leave, he was, he was looking around. And then he turned to me and he says, he, he looked at the, the church uh, felt the atmosphere, seen the stained glass windows, whatever, and he said, I'm experiencing far better than I deserve. And I thought, wow, he gets it. He really gets it. You know, he may not be a churched person, but he understands something that's fundamental to our spiritual experience, and that is that we get a whole lot better than what we deserve. I'd like to have you turn with me to 1 Timothy, all right? 1 Timothy 1. Timothy's after Thessalonians. Kind of in the middle of your, the latter part of your New Testament. This was Paul's experience, and what we're going to read here feeds in and underlines, underscores what we are going to talk about in another text in a few moments. Here's what Paul says, verse 12. I'm using English Standard Version today. I hope it's close enough to what you have in front of you. I thank him, Paul says, speaking of God, who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. Now, let's just stop there for a minute. If you think about Paul's experience and what he was prior to his Christian experience, he was literally an Osama ben Saul, okay? That's what he was. He was like these terrorists that we've been reading and hearing so much about in the last week or two. He was just like them. And with religious zeal, because that is what drives them. Uh, it is religious zeal, wrongly informed, that is so strong that it feels that you're doing service to God if you kill other people to do it. And that's where Saul was. That is where he was before he came to Paul. Wow. And yet, look what God did with him. But he says here, Formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord 
overflowed me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. You know the word gratitude? We use that. At Thanksgiving time, we should have gratitude. Gratitude, if you go look at your Funkin' Wagnalls or your Webster's, grata, the first part of that, literally comes from a Latin word that's a translation of grace. When we have gratitude, we've been graced, and we recognize it. And the grace of the Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners of who I am the foremost. I'm chief sinner. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me is the foremost. Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And I would like to suggest to you, maybe you and I would not classify ourselves in, in the same uh, kind of posture as Paul was as a persecutor or a chief sinner. But the reality is, is that we've all sinned, and so we're all chiefs, right? We're all chiefs. Any one of us, as a result of an individual sin, would have been responsible for the death of Christ on the cross, because that's what it would have taken. Even one sin for him to give us salvation was death on the cross. And so we're all chief sinners. And he chooses us. He gives us mercy so that he can display his perfect patience in what each one of us. That is why we're chosen. And that is why we're saved. Paul was thankful. You know, there's, there's two attitudes, really, that we can basically go, basically go at life with. And one is thanksgiving, and the other is grudge living, right? Those are really the two ways that people tend to go. They're either thankful or they hold grudges, and they live with grudges. I was uh, reading <clears throat> in a Bible commentary, and a story was told uh, <clears throat> by Roy Gain, who's one of our Adventist writers and theologians. He tells about a friend, Israeli friend, um, who told him about a Russian Jew. This Russian Jew uh, immigrated during the, the time around World War II to, um, to Israel. And as he came in to Ben-Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv, there was a reporter, a reporter that met him because it was rather rare for this to happen, okay, at that time. And the reporter met him and he said, how was life in Russia? And the Russian said, I don't complain. Well, how are the housing conditions? I don't complain. Well, how are the working conditions? I don't complain. And so the reporter was a little bit exasperated, and he said, okay, if you didn't have reason to complain about life in Russia, why did you move to Israel? And he said, because in Israel, I can complain. Yeah. Have you ever found yourself complaining? It's something that we're quite good at. And if you read the, the history of Israel in the wilderness, you discover they did a lot of it, didn't they? They did a lot of it. They weren't always thankful for the fact that they had been freed from slavery in Egypt. And we have the right, we can complain here in our country quite openly. Uh, and sometimes it creates more problems uh, for sure than anything else. You know, the real difference between a thankful attitude and an ungrateful or unthankful attitude is really in one word. If you think about the word thanksgiving, we think about the thank part, but it's the giving part, the thanksgiving part, that really makes thanksgiving good, I think. Because thanksgiving is outward-centered. It's not self-centered, is it? It's thanksgiving. It's not just thanks, it's thanksgiving. And uh, hopefully it's expressed in our relationships with, with other people as well as to God. Okay, Philippians chapter 4 that was read in our scripture. Let's go there. Philippians, great book, awesome book. Uh, one of my favorites uh, in the Bible because it's so positive. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, right there. Philippians 4, we go. such a positive chapter. We can't spend the whole time on it. 
But in verse 10 again, we'll pick up what Rossio read. Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received, revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So what Paul is really doing here is he's thanking the Philippian church for the generosity and the gifts that they have given him, particularly as he is in prison. He says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I'm going to come back to that word. I know how to be brought low. In other words, I know how to be humbled. I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound. In every, any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul here outlines what I think was the content of his contentment. The word contentment has as the first part of it content, right? What's the content of our contentment? How content are you today? Now, con contentment isn't necessarily synonymous with thanksgiving, but I do think there are parallel terms. Some people are content with things they shouldn't be content with. But in general, I think contentment, true contentment, is very similar to being thankful. Same basic idea, and it's expressed here in Paul's words. What was the secret to the, the core content of Paul's contentment that allowed him to be able to say, I can be brought low, I can be abased, I can play the role at the bottom of the pile, I can be the crow, <laughs> as in our story, or I could essentially be exalted. I can live on both planes and not let it go to my head. <laughs> but let's start with some of these keys. Paul says, I know how to be abased. I know how to be brought low. How did he learn to deal with that? Well, I think the answer is in chapter 2, if you just turn back. Beautiful little, uh, some, some scholars feel this is a hymn. It's one of the most beautiful, profound expressions of God's love and his service to us uh, in this chapter. But notice in verse 3 of chapter 2, Paul says, Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in what? Humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. In humility. What's interesting here is that the word humility, the word translated humility here, is the same word that's translated brought low or abased in chapter 4 that we just read. And so his example of what it is to be humiliated is, is here and in the fact that Christ did not grasp being equal to God, but humbled himself and came down to our level and died on the cross. So that was the center of the reason why Paul can say, I know how to be abased. You know, humility is, is one of the toughest, toughest uh, characteristics, Christian characteristics to have or to develop. And if we ask for humility, we need to be ready for what it takes, <laughs> don't we? It's, it's hard to be humble indeed. Very hard to be humble. H.W. Beecher says, Pride slays thanksgiving, but a humble mind is the soil of which thanks naturally grows. A proud man is seldom a grateful man, but he never thinks he gets as much as because he thinks he never gets as much as he deserves. And when it comes to living maybe a little lower 
than what we would sometimes like to think we deserve, I think there's three keys to happiness in that. And I'll list them right here. Number one, in order to have that kind of an attitude, we have to own nothing, ask for nothing, and deserve nothing. All right? I'll repeat those. Own nothing, be asking for nothing, uh, in terms of, you know, grasping at it, and deserving nothing. Do, what do I mean by owning nothing? Because obviously in this earth, we're going to own some things. You're going to own your vehicles, you're going to own your house, or perhaps, you know, there's a lot of things that you're going to purchase that you own. I think Paul, in his experience, owned nothing. But not in the literal sense. But I think he had an experience where whatever he had, whatever he possessed, he didn't claim the ownership to the point that if he lost it, he lost his happiness and he lost his joy. I think he realized that he was a steward of life and of God's gifts. He was just a manager of it. And if it was taken away, no big deal. Because it was God's in the first place. It's kind of like what we do when we pay tithe. We just return what's God's already. Uh, and we only manage the money uh, that we have. <coughs> That's what I mean uh, by owning nothing. And I think it, it includes um, relinquishing control over the lives of others. You know, sometimes we can consume an awful a lot of time and, and, and interest and energy in trying to make sure everybody else lines up to the ideal. That's really not our job, is it? We don't own other people. You know, that was the problem with the Christian church through many centuries and was reflected again in what I was talking about was happening in New England with the, with the Puritan Congregational Reformed churches of the time, is they wanted to control everybody else's life. And uh, that's what Roger Williams tried to get away from. And sometimes we, 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 we spend too much time and energy trying to make sure everybody else lines up. That's God's work. He can do that. Paul could say, even if others are doing wrong and doing it in the wrong way for the wrong reasons, Christ is proclaimed. Go uh, back to chapter 1, verse 12. Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest of it that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. But then he goes on, he says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely thinking, but to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. That is what really matters. It's that Christ is proclaimed. They may not even be doing it the right way. They may not even have the right mo motive, but at least God's work is getting done. So owning nothing or, own, or any, owning no one. What about... Asking for nothing. I don't mean that in the literal sense. We're all going to ask things. We're all going to ask God for things. But not expecting them in such a way that if we don't get them, again, our center of, of balance, our contentment, is thrown out the window. We don't have to have a claim or fame or things that if we didn't have, we would be miserable. And in that sense, I think Paul uh, did not expect the right things as he wanted them to come his way. He wasn't looking for compliments. He wasn't looking for cheers. He just wanted to proclaim Christ. And lastly, I don't think that he felt that he deserved anything. We read that uh, just prior in 1 Timothy what he knew he deserved. But Christ in his mercy uh, helped him out, gave him grace. 
You know, I, I, I had a classmate in grade school that was very smart. She was very smart. But I'll remember, I remember her so many times going up to the teacher's desk. And if she had gotten a red mark on a test or a paper she had written, she would go up and argue and argue and argue to try to get that point back. And she was very, very unhappy if she didn't get that point back. Now, she was, a, she was pretty much a straight-A student, and I applaud that. She was way ahead of me. I was not. At that point in my life, I didn't care what grades I got. Uh, so I probably should have been more on the other end <laughs> of things. But she would struggle for every point, and it was that way through the remainder of her life. I remember reading in an alumni, college alumni circular that came to my desk decades later, and the same classmate had expressed her discontent to the editor because her station in life and her title in life had not been recognized. And I thought, you know, here's an individual whose security and happiness and contentment is completely based and founded in whether she gets, you know, a certain grade level or she gets certain recognition. And she's never satisfied because, you know, enough is not enough. Never satisfied. Columnist Sidney Harris says, Mother used to say, enough is as good as a feast. But almost nobody thinks he or she has enough in one department of life or another. Fame is not enough. Talent is not enough. Honor is not enough. Power is not enough. Wealth is not enough. Gratefulness is the quality most wanting here. Gratitude is the gift of life for being given what we have and being what we are. Enough, as my mother never knew, is better than a feast. It's a blessing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Paul had that quality. Uh, <clears throat> you may have heard this story about these folk by the name of the Simons. The Simons lived somewhere on the East Coast. They lived same, uh, 20 years in the same house. Uh, I've not had that experience in my life. Uh, I think we've moved probably 22 or so times in the course of ministry. Never in the same house very long. But they lived in the same house for 20 years. But they decided they wanted something bigger and something better than what they had. They were tired of it, so they listed the house and began a rather frenetic search for another house. They drove back roads. They searched the papers. They even inquired at homes that were not for sale. <laughs> One day, Mr. Simons came home, and his wife was excitingly studying an ad in the paper, and she said, I think we have just found the house that we want. He said, which one is it? She showed him. He said, let's call the realtor. And the next day they went in to the realtor and uh, he said, which one, which house do you want? What have you found? And they told him. And there was a long silence and the realtor said, Mr. Simon, Mr. and Mrs. Simon, I've never had this happen before, but the house you want to see is the house you are living in now. Paul says, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Huh? To be content. I know how to be abased. But he also says, I know how to abound. I know how to deal with it when it's going good, too. I can live the whole spectrum. I can, I, I can be at any, at any place. You know, Paul had a unique experience that, uh, you know, we could probably count on several fingers in, in the life of humanity of people having the experience of visionary uh, entry into the kingdom of heaven. Visionary, not actual, visionary prophets and such who had that experience. Paul had that. He said, I was once caught up into the third heaven. He didn't understand exactly how, he says, but I was caught up into the third heaven. He had the privilege of seeing the kingdom little ahead of time. So he knew how to abound. Incidentally, though, in the face of that exaltation, you remember that he prayed three times for an affliction to be taken away, a thorn in the flesh. And it wasn't taken away. And the reason it wasn't taken away was because of the potential for it to go to his head, the experience that he'd had, this exalted experience of visionary uh, entry into the kingdom. And so uh, God had to keep give him something to kind of kind of keep him down. But that was part of the whole recipe of his, his contentment. He knew how to be abased. 
and he knew how to abound. You know, um, Paul was an incredible person. Um, he, he experienced so much adversity. And he gives us a resume of, of his experience in 2 Corinthians. Um, and I'm going to come back to that in, in just a second. But in, in connection with being abounding, living in the overflow, I'm always struck by the example of Christ in relationship to being abased or, or bound. This is from Desire of Ages. Most of you are familiar probably with this book. And I love this comment. This is speaking of Christ now, but I think it was true also in many respects with Paul. In the heart of Christ, where reigned perfect harmony with God, there was perfect peace. There's the key, isn't it? Perfect harmony with God, perfect peace. But here's, here's, here's the part that just knocks me over. He was never elated by applause nor dejected by censure or disappointment. That just blows me away. Jesus never was, he never got this big ego lift out of compliments and applause. Jesus wasn't a performer that did what he did to get applause. He did it because he came, he loved, and he wanted to save sinners. And so what, what the servant of the Lord is saying there is that if he did get a compliment, probably didn't get a lot of them in his life, but he, he did get some, it, it, didn't, it didn't go to his head, and he didn't get all elated and puffed up about it. But, but even the, the, the harder part, though, is that he didn't get dejected by censure or criticism. Now, I don't know about you, it's pretty easy as a human being when, when people clap for us, for it to go to our head. It's pretty easy for us if somebody criticizes us or censures us to go into the depths of depression, right? Very hard. And part of our problem is, is that we, we make comparisons. That was in the story, uh, the, the crows and the swans and the other birds this morning. We should never make those kinds of comparisons. We are what we are, and we should just live under the grace of God for the gifts, with the gifts that he's given us. But to not get depressed or not get to elated uh, because of the way people treat us, that's a high quality. Jesus had it. I believe Paul had it, and it's something that we want to pray for, that God gives us that ability. But Paul says here in Philippians, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. I have learned. I have learned in any all circumstances, you know, how to deal with this. And experience is a great instructor. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22, he said, I was in prison often. Now, I've never been in prison, particularly for my faith, so I haven't got that one chalked up yet. Um, five times. Five times, he says, that he received 40 stripes save one. Now, folks, any one of those should have killed him. Any one of them. He got it five times, and we're just getting started. Three times he was beaten with rods. One time he was stoned. That should have killed him. It would have killed me, except for the grace of God. I know that. I would have been long dead. Three times he was shipwrecked. Said he spent a night and a day floating, uh, floating on the ocean and in multiple other perils that he does not live. Paul learned through those experiences. And sometimes we have a hard time with the experiences God allows us to go through, but they, they help us learn how to be content. They help us to learn how to be thankful. British journalist and World War I soldier Malcolm Mag Muggeridge says this, he says, contrary to what might be expected as I look back on experiences that at the time seemed especially desolating and painful with particular satisfaction. 
Indeed, I can say with complete truthfulness that everything that I have learned in my 75 years in this world, everything that has truly enhanced and enlightened my existence has been through affliction and not through happiness. In other words, if it were possible to eliminate affliction from our earthly existence by means of some drug or other medical mumbo-jumbo, the result would be to make life banal and trivial to endure. This is, of course, why, what the cross signifies. And the cross, more than anything else, draws me to Christ. But what he's saying is that the greatest thanksgiving tends to grow out of affliction. And as you look at your own life, and as I look at my life, my greatest thanksgiving, my greatest contentment really comes in those moments when I recognize God's goodness. And it comes out of affliction. Because it usually takes affliction to wake us up, doesn't it? usually does. Victor Frankl, who was a Jewish psychiatrist that suffered incomprehensible things in the Nazi de death camps of World War II. His entire family was wi wiped out with the exception of one sister. And this is what he says. He says, we who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken away from a man, and I'm just going to add her a woman, but one thing. The last of human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any one set of circumstances. You know, we look at what's happening in our world today. There are horrific things happening. And we can always be thankful that they're not happening here. And that's okay. We should be. We don't know when they may happen here. You know, what will our attitude be? Can we be thankful even in the midst of difficult circumstances? Paul said he learned to do that. But how did he learn to do that? Because he says in the very last of this, of this passage, I can do how much? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There is the ultimate key. The, that inner relationship of Christ in his life. And I believe that living thankfully, contentedly, means relating to people and events in a loving and redemptive way prayerfully remembering others who are in difficulty at the time where maybe we are not so much in it. I just, um, I just read yesterday about an Adventist church member who lives in Kazakhstan, long way from us, his name, and I'll probably slaughter it in pronunciation, but it looks like uh, Yiklas Kwabduekwasov, okay? Something like that. Something like that. He's a 54-year-old member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Kazakhstan, and he has been sentenced to seven years uh, of house arrest, and, he, and here's why. He was convicted of inciting religious hatred. Now, you and I know, uh, as a member, that's not probably what he was doing at all. Witnesses testified that this gentleman had expressed ideas that insulted Muslims and the Prophet Muhammad. So he not only is under arrest, but he also might pay, must pay $500 to cover the cost of his own trial, right? This is one of our members over there who doesn't enjoy the religious freedoms that we enjoy here. You know, it's interesting because at the United Nations level, there has been considerable pressure in the last decade for the United Nations to take actions that would require that if you insult any other religion, that you can be jailed. But insulting any other religion could be as simple as proclaiming what you believe to be true and saying what the other religious entity believes is not true. It could be that simple. 
And, and I believe that it is not, you know, perhaps too far distant or impossible that that kind of legislation could be in introduced on a global scale and that we would lose many of the freedoms that we now enjoy. But in the meantime, we want to live contentedly. We want to live thanksgivingly. And we want to live out that giving part, that loving part of thanksgiving. And I want to conclude with this comment that was in an article in one of our uh, circulars. And it says, those who follow Jesus, and again, I'm thinking even of the individual who blew up other people last week. Think about this. This really challenged me. Those who follow Jesus are under obligation to love their neighbors and to love their enemies and pray for those who persecute them. Christians do not deny that there are enemies nor refuse to acknowledge that people hate them. So if there are a group of people claiming to be Muslims who are our enemies, Christ must still, Christians must still think creatively about to how to love those people. For those who find this too demanding, there are a number of other lords to follow besides Jesus. Jesus has told us to love our enemies, hasn't he? Doesn't mean we have to love what they do. Doesn't mean we have to accept what they do. But it does mean we have to love them. And if we don't love them, you know, Jesus has said, this is how all men will know that you are my disciples if you do what? If you love one another, including your enemies. So we need to pray for any and all people that are out there uh, today. Paul says, I've learned how to be abased. I have learned how to abound. I have learned in every circumstance because what of Christ, what Christ has done for me that I can do all things. I can be thankful. I can love my enemies. I, you know, I can be totally content. And that is my prayer today, is that we pray for and live out that kind of experience, uh, not only in this season, but every day of the year. We're going to uh, sing a, a hymn that I just love during, during this, this season, Let All Things Now Living, a song of thanksgiving. stand on page 560 
Father in heaven, we have so many things to be thankful for. And we, we thank you for not only the, the material things that we have, but the privileges that we have of sharing your goodness to other people and your love. Lord, we thank you for, for family and for church and for community all these blessings. But thank you, thank you first and foremost for, for Jesus. Because it's, it's because of his sacrifice and his coming to this earth that we have any hope at all. That we have any reason to give thanksgiving. And uh, so we, we praise you and thank you. And Lord, on this Sabbath that we thank you for too, uh, may we always remember you as our Savior and to come away from this day with greater peace in our heart that we can spread around our church. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.